Congrats. This meeting is being recorded. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome to Alta Live. We're going to wait a few seconds while our attendees um, fill in, as it does take a, a minute or so to get everyone in the room. While that's happening, I'm going to do a little bit of Alta Live bookkeeping. Hi and welcome. Welcome to Alta Live. This is the digital event series for Alta Journal. We are a quarterly magazine focused on California and the West. In fact, we were just having a conversation on what is the West. So dive into the chat and let us know how you define the West if you feel like it today. Um, I'm Beth Spots, what I'm Alta's digital editor. And today I am so excited to welcome writer Marissa Silver. She is the author of seven works of fiction, including the bestsellers, Mary Coyne and Little Nothing. And now her new book is The Mysteries. It was reviewed by Heather Scott Partington for Alta Online earlier this month. Um, and so Heather and Marissa are going to chat today about Marissa's work, answer your questions. Um, they're going to talk for about 25 minutes. In fact, Marissa is going to read for us, I think, kick this off with a reading. Um, please use the Q&A button or the chat to ask questions. Um, and I'm going to pop back in about 25 minutes and we'll get to as many of those questions as we have time, as we have time for. If you've got to leave early, if you're late to today's event, don't worry, this is all being recorded and will be posted at altaonline.com later this afternoon. We'll also be taking notes, any books, um, Heather's review, a link to buy the mysteries. We'll, we'll send all of that to you in an email this afternoon as well. So with that, I'm gonna get lost. I will turn this over to the very talented Marissa and my friend, Heather. Thank you, Beth. Thank you so much. Hi, Heather. Hi, Hi, welcome. <laughs> I'm so glad that we could chat today about this wonderful book. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Um, so I understand that you have something that you'd like to read just to start us off and kind of give us a sense of who these characters are. Yeah, I'm just going to start reading from the beginning of the book, just a very short reading, just because I think it's kind of nice sometimes to hear the book in the author's voice. Um, and here we go. They are running. There is no reason to go slow. They run out of Mickey's bedroom, down the stairs, through the living room, skipping over the albums that lie scattered across the floor. Miggy nimbly avoids Brubeck, Evans, and Monk, but she wants to crush them too, to hear the satisfying snap of the records under her kids, to feel the momentary pulse of destruction. No, her mind says, why not? Because no, her mother would say sharply, Jean's reactions are one part anger and two parts fear, the fault between those feelings align Miggy's senses in the quaver of misgiving that passes across her mother's face when she wants to reprimand her daughter. It's a line Miggy can't resist treading, the same way she must trouble a loose tooth, the sharp pain and dull tickle equally irresistible. Who are you, her mother asked, after Miggy shattered the back window of the station wagon with a rock or drew a butterfly on the living room rug because a rock so dense in the hand must be flung and a magic marker its tip as wet as a dog's nose must draw. I am Miggy, she said, but of course her mother knew that. The words mother and father don't exist without the word Miggy. She is the reason for them. I am Miggy, she declares now as she dances around the albums, imagining them as lily pads, imagining herself as a fairy so light she can land on the water between the pads and not drown. Or maybe the albums are the water and the space between are leaves the size of elephant feet because everything is itself and always then the inside out of itself. A shirt, a lie, vomit, a dream. I am Ellen, Ellen says more quietly because this is not her house. These are not her father's records. Those are not her parents' empty tumblers sitting on the coffee table where water rings and cigarette burn marks are branded into the wood. Will you stop just for one minute, Jean always says. But even when Miggy tries as hard as she can to stand still, something inside her sparks, like the telephone wire that whipped across the street during last winter's ice storm, spitting electricity into the frigid air. She bursts with a desire to move, to speak, to sing, because there is so much, there is so much all the time that even if she could spread her arms wider than the universe, she still could not hold it all. There are the mosquito bites that she is not supposed to scratch. There are starbursts of blood on her arms and shins because she can't help it. There is knowing what she's supposed to do and not doing it and knowing how she is supposed to behave and misbehaving. It makes her skin prickle. It makes her choose a great popsicle 
then wished she'd chosen red so that her lips would be painted in defiance of her mother, who says that makeup is not for children. Her rage at the injustice overcomes her. She is mad at the popsicles and mad at her mother, who always says, choose one. But how and why? I love it. <laughs> I wrote down two two of my favorite lines, which I remember from reading it, but the uh, everything being the also the inside out of itself. I just love that. And the the live telephone wire inside of her. Um, so this novel is about uh, this character, Miggy, and this and this girl, Ellen, and, and their friendship. Two young girls. Um, there's sort of a uh, difference. In, there is a difference in personality between the two of them. And we get a window into, um, into both of them, really. But Miggy especially has such a strong voice. And I was uh, wondering if you could just talk about how you developed that voice for Miggy. Um, one of the things that I was really struck by, and I wrote about this in my review, was it feels so childlike, but it's not, it doesn't cross over into something that feels, you know, juvenile. It, it, uh, it maintains the spirit of, you know, that too muchness that we all have inside us when we're young, but it's, it's written beautifully and it's filtered through, obviously, uh, an adult uh, perspective. So I wanted to start off there and, and if you could just talk about how you developed that. Sure. Um, you know, Miggy kind of came to me really quickly um, as a character, which is really unusual. Most characters take me a long time to get to know and to kind of plumb the, the complexities of. But Miggy was kind of right there in the same way that she's right there as a, as a character. She's sort of no holds barred. She's unruly. She's wild. She's mischievous. She's kind of shaking a fist at all the limitations around her seven-year-old life. Um, and she really was just popped into my mind. I mean, there she was. I knew how she would look and behave and move. And, you know, I knew what her energy was and I knew when it waned and when it waxed. Um, the tricky part was what you're talking about, which is sort of finding the tone of the novel, the way in which to both be present in her momentary experience and yet be able to have uh, use language and imagery and association that a seven-year-old wouldn't use. So it was really about trying to, you know, a kind of slow um, finding that balance between um, being, you know, in her body, seeing through her eyes, and also being able to sort of pull back, not enormous amount narratively, but enough so that um, there was a more textured and, you know, kind of literary framework around her. But what I really realized quickly with Miggy was that she, being inside her physically was the way to express her, that she is, she expresses herself physically. And so having her move, what, having her flop down on a couch or, you know, fall down and scrape her knee or those sorts of things were really strong ways of connecting to her immediate experience because of the kind of kinetic kid that she is. I love that you mentioned that. I was um, looking back this morning over uh, an interview that we did a long time ago for Electric Literature for Little Nothing. Uh -huh. And you were talking about um, the physicality of a character and that a character is so much embodied by how they move. And one of the things, one of my favorite things from that book is uh, when you write from the perspective of a wolf. Mm -hmm. And, you know, totally, totally different with Miggy, but I love that the that the physical, um, her physical being is just as important. I, I'm a former dancer, so I feel like there's so much like choreography yeah. in that. Um, I love that. Um, so how did the idea for this story where you have this tragedy that occurs between these two families, how did, how did where did the spark of this novel come from? The spark of it actually came um, from a story that my father had told me it was something that had happened to him that there's, you know, I don't want, we're not going to give away spoilers, but there is a sort of central tragedy around which this story turns and the two families, Miggy's family and Ellen's family and the girls are both, you know, affected and, and, and their trajectories are changed as a result of it. Um, the, the, this, the tragic thing that happens in the book is something that had happened to my father when he was a young boy. And it was sort of a story that I remember him telling me exactly once, um, and he never elaborated on it. He never told me how he felt or, or how he felt as a child when it happened or how he felt as an adult thinking back mm -hmm. on it. He never told me about the other people who were involved. Um, so it sort of in some ways, you know, to, to coin the, the title of the book, it was a mystery for me. You know, it was one of those, you know, sometimes you hear stories from your parents and then when you um, 
think about them when you're older and maybe even, you know, my dad's passed at this point, I'm thinking, why did I never find out more about that? It, I mean, it was sort of important enough for him to tell me, but not, but then there was a part of him that obviously didn't want to fully explore that experience with me. So I think it was just sort of a little, a question that always has lived with me. And so I just decided to write a book that didn't explore his story in particular, but explored a situation like that. Did did you, um, I know that you don't like to write with meaning in mind, that you like to kind of be surprised where the character and uh, their voice takes you. Um, what surprised you as you were writing this book about your characters? You know, what surprised me the most was I, I realized um, that every single character in the book, maybe save Miggy, maybe save the girls, um, was their ambivalence. And you know, when we write, we so often, you know, ask ourselves, well, what does our character want, right? And that's that that defining their want or their desire, whether it's they want the pot of gold or they want love or they want, you know, whatever it is, that it sort of helps us figure them out and and kind of create present them to a reader. And every time I asked myself what the adults in this book wanted, I couldn't find the a single answer. They sort of wanted something and its opposite at the same time. And so that was a surprise to me and also a challenge to me because it's it's much harder to write ambivalence than it is to write clarity of purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that way, I mean, you know, I kept I kept trying to squeeze them into, you know, one one thing they wanted um, to make it easier for myself, quite frankly, um, and also to make them a little more legible maybe for the reader. But then I realized I had to just kind of lean into their ambivalence and that that was what became legible to the reader. And I think in some ways they became more interesting to me as a writer um, once I allowed myself to try to figure out how to describe ambivalence, because I think most of us are about a lot of things. Do you think that that's um, in part because of the, the time and place that you set the novel in? Um, I read your interview in Lit Hub and you talked about you know, 1973 being a time of, I forget the word that you use, but, you know, transition and there's a lot of uh, turmoil and, and lots of things going on. Do you think that that was also, uh, that those two things are uh, related in terms of um, how it came to you? Related, I don't know whether, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg. <laughs> I think that I said it in that time because it was a time when I was a child. And so I think there was a lot of sense memory that I was able to draw from. Um, but as you say, I mean, 1973 was an incredibly, um, it was a kind of challenging time. I mean, there's so many things were going on. The Vietnam War was finally winding down. And I think the country sort of had this sense of, you know, deflation after it, after, you know, the sheer kind of futility of it was fully recognized. Um, and I think with anything, you know, it, it, cre it created so much animation and so much energy in the country in terms of protests and all that. And when it's over, there's a sort of sense of, I don't know, futility, I think. Um, and then, you know, there was a recession, there was economic stress, there was um, Watergate was happening. So the sense of the government is being completely um, non untrustworthy um, was so, so it was a time of a lot of ambivalence. And I think that that um, certainly provided a, a rich backdrop to the characters in terms of that. But I don't know that people now are any less ambivalent than they yeah. were then, you know? It's just so happens that what was going on in that moment um, created a lot of an uncertainty, a certain amount of kind of low boiled despair, I think. Um, and it, it, it created a kind of subtle emotional backdrop for what was going on for the characters. Yeah, I was going to ask if uh, if there was anything in particular that was going on in the world as you were writing the book, because that same sense of unease um, that that exists in the book, I, I think so much uh, is happening right now. Is there was there anything that was that was happening around the time that you were writing it that affected you? Well, um, I mean, the biggest thing that was happening around the time that I was writing it was, you know, having Trump in office and and yeah. the sorts of things that were happening as a result of that. And I will be, you know, brazenly open about my political views on that subject. But, you know, it was terrifying every time you open the newspaper and you saw him do one more thing that was deleterious to huge factions of the country. Um, and there was a sense of like, what is going to happen to us? What, what, I mean, that really for the first time in, in recent memory, this real sense of 
kind of global peril, you know? I mean, and, and the sense of like this one person could be really destroying so much. Um, so that was happening. I mean, I finished the book before the pandemic. So I, although I was, you know, kind of doing all the editorial work during the pandemic, but yeah, I mean, in just in describing what I was, what it, it's 1973, I was just thinking about what we're all feeling right now, which is that, you know, as the pandemic in this country begin, begins to get more under control, there's both elation and there's this kind of, you know, we were talking about it in the green room before this, this, this sort of exhaustion and uncertainty of like, wh what just happened and how do we go forward? So yeah, not not dissimilar. I felt like with the with all four of the parents too, there was this sense for each of them in a different way, but like something they had counted on as what adulthood was going to be like or what parenthood was going to look like turned out not to be true or no longer to be true. You know, um, you have like the hardware store and you know generational um, passing down of things like that or expectation. What is it going to be like to be a mother? What's it going to be like to be a father? And that everybody's kind of evaluating like, okay, what I assumed about the world isn't necessarily true at the same time as these two young girls are kind of trying to interpret the world and trying to figure out what, what is true, what can they, you know, what's just fear and what's reality and, and where do they exist um, kind of between those two things. Well, that's a gorgeous reading of this book, Heather. Thank you. <laughs> But yes, I know problem. <laughs> the girls are, um, you know, they're both, they're seven. And, you know, somebody once asked me why I chose seven. And I thought a lot about it. And I realized that seven is sort of a time when you can both um, hold magical thinking in your in your mind at the same time that you're beginning to grasp some realities and that you can hold them both at the same time. You can be absolutely 100% sure that a monster lives in the forest as Miggy is at the same time that you can begin to understand what war is or what, you know, those coffins, flag draped coffins are, what's inside those coffins, um, which Miggy is exposed to. So um, yes, I mean, there's sort of, you know, I guess the mysteries of the title is all about that sense of, you know, there's endless things that are mysterious and they don't actually get less mysterious the older that you get. Um, you know, you may have more perspective and you may have more knowledge base, but the big questions about life and death and God and not God and, you know, love, those remain sort of open-ended and we're constantly asking, asking those questions over and over again, I think, until the end of our lives. So, um, so the answer to that is yes, there's these two things going on, the girls sort of grappling to find some purchase in in the in the real world at the same time that the parents are understanding that um what they imagined their lives might be turns out to be very different mm -hmm. so uh, miggy is very much the wild child that other kids are attracted to and ellen is one of those kids that attaches herself to um sort of the wild bold um, more outgoing, braver um, child. So, so which were you more like in childhood? Were you, a, were you an Ellen or were you a Miggy? I think I was an Ellen if I had to choose one side of the binary. I definitely wasn't like Miggy. And I remember I had a, a, a friend like Miggy in preschool and I'll never forget. I mean, it was a hundred million years ago, but this friend, I went home to her house one day and I let her cut off all my hair. And, and that is the kind of very easy thing that would happen. I, you know, I can still remember my mother's reaction, but there are these sort of incandescent, you know, really charismatic kids of all, at all ages. And um, they're dangerous. They're kind of doing things and saying things that you might be scared to do and say. And the fact that they're doing it allows you to sort of, you're almost like, um, you know, getting to sort of uh, be in the shadows of that. Um, but at the same time, during the course of the novel, Ellen begins to come into her own. And so there is a slight, you know, shift of dynamic. But, um, you know, what I wanted to write about was a, a, the kind of intensity and changeability and, and kind of molten quality of young friendships, especially um, this friendship between two young girls. Um, it, they're, they're unbelievably emotionally complicated young friendships. And I wanted to kind of give them their due. Yeah, I, I think you express really well the volatility too of young friendships, you know, that that uh, how much kids are unable sometimes to control what they say, and then they'll say something that ends up being kind of really terrible. And then, oh, no, I can't take it back that they're, they're learning, you know, how do they even navigate communication um, 
between each other. And I I so remember my kids, you know, coming home one day and saying that they now hated X, who was their best friend. (laughs) And I finally learned not to say anything because the next day that X would become their best friend again. You know, there's this. (laughs) Yeah. It's almost like kids are are this petri dish. They're trying out all the emotions that they're ever going to have in their lives, right? In these in these in these relationships that they have, which are so unburdened by um, kind of adult perspective, and they're mm-hmm. just full on. I mean, there there's no you know you don't you don't start to hide yourself or protect yourself or have intimacy problems, you know, for the most part when you're that age. So um, you know, it's a wonderful thing to try to breathe life into the, the um, complexity of those young relationships. So I asked you this uh, when we spoke about little nothing, I'm gonna ask the same question again. Um, you've written, especially your, your three most recent novels are so different. Um, in Mary Coyne, you had historical inspiration and little nothing. You wrote kind of from the perspective of a fairy tale slash allegory. Um, and then with this novel, you have a very uh, realist, realistic novel. Um, so what are the common threads? What are the things that uh, tie your work together? That's a really great question. Well, I, I think to some, to some degree, no matter what the, the, the shape or form of the novel is, there's kind of an emotional truthfulness. I mean, even when I was writing about a wolf, I was trying to, you know, reach for the emotional truth of that wolf situation. And um, so I think, I think, I think that's one thing. I think the other, um, I think I often write about parents and children in some form or other that I'm interested in that relationship. I'm interested in the kind of um, way that it's not a perfect thing and that, you know, we are not good or bad mothers and fathers. We are people and they are not good and bad children. They are people. Um, so I think I write a lot about that. I think that, um, and I guess the other thing that would tie them together is maybe sort of a certain kind of energy. I don't know that a, a different, a, the prose, when I read it, it there's a kind of ener- a certain kind of similar energy in the prose, but I, I guess, you know, I feel like every idea that I come to requires its own form of telling. And so um, I don't really think to myself, oh, I better write a novel like the last one because people liked it or people bought it. I just, if I come up with an idea and it doesn't, it, 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 it requires its own way of being told. I mean, it's probably not good for branding if one is, <laughs> but um, I think my interest is less in that than in kind of, exploring kind of the range of my imaginative curiosity. Mm-hmm. I love that. I, um, I'm such a fan. <laughs> <laughs> I, when I, I was um, in 2017, I was doing a teacher training at the Library of Congress and they were showing us, you know, all their exciting things they had in the collection and they had the migrant mother photograph, you know, for the prints and photographs um, library and those people were out. And I was like, oh my God, I've talked to Marissa Silver who wrote, and they were like, we know, Mary Coyne. We, <laughs> they, they must be hearing it all the time. So, um, you know, you're- That's funny. Oh, well, that's kind of- Far nice. and wide. Yeah, it was great. Okay. I thought I was going to be really telling them something and they were like, yeah. <laughs> So I feel like that's uh, probably a good place to bring Beth back and we can answer some of the questions from the chat. Thank you so much. Uh, before Beth starts mm-hmm. asking questions, I wanna make sure that we give you a chance to let people know where they can find you online. Where can they keep up with all things Marissa Silver? All things Marissa Silver. Um, MarissaSilver.com is my website. Um, and uh, I'm on Facebook. You can find me on Facebook if you want. I'm on Instagram. Um, but yeah, so all things, all things literary, Marissa, I'm not, the, I'm not the great, like, here's my entire life story, <laughs> great. <Marissa. laughs> but thank you for having me. And it's been great oh, it's you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Hey Beth. Um, hi, that was really fun. I have, I have a couple of questions. I know we're, we're getting close to time, but, um, Brett asks Marissa, who do you show your work to as you write? As you write, oh. um, and how far along is your work when you first share it with that trusted reader? Well, my husband is my most trusted reader, and I show him work. 
I don't know, all, at all different times when I need a kind of at a girl, when I need um, a, an actual person to look at, does this part of the story work? So he sees a lot of it in, in very rough form. Um, but in terms of other, you know, like when my agent is actually a phenomenal reader and, um, but I tend to show him things um, when they're in a pretty finished state because I, or, or as finished as I can make it. I tend to show people things when I feel like I can't get further. But when I feel like I can identify the problem and if I just sit with it, I'll figure it out. I, I won't show I won't show the work. It's it's almost the point at which I have no more resources and I need other people to to help me. Blaze asked, um, you mentioned the tragedy that was inspired by something that had happened to your father. What other parts of the book are loosely autobiographical and how do you navigate the tension between actual truth and emotional truth? Well, that's a great question. Um, and, and probably could be an article, a, a full hour of thought. Um, <laughs> almost very little in my books are, are autobiographical. I mean, I definitely draw details. I mean, I had a dog named Susie. There's a dog named Susie in this, in this book. Um, they both gave birth in a similar way, but I tend not to use kind of big emotional uh, autobiographical truths in my, in my stories. Um, so it's really more just, you know, little Easter eggs from my, my family that they'll find. But, um, and in terms, so, so in that way, I don't really negotiate it because I haven't ever really said, okay, I'm going to write the story of my mother or I'm going to write the story of my, I'm, I'm pretty much um, in my imagination. And even with Mary Coyne, and I know we're, we're wrapping up quickly, but which was based on a true story. Um, it wasn't really until I put away the photograph and put away the information about the real characters it was based on and let my imagination completely take over that the book really took flight. So I found that the truth, truth part of it was a little bit of an emotional, I mean, a imaginative, like, you know, what's, what's the word, a choke, a chokehold. So I, I, I kind of rely on my imagination more than anything else. Last question. Um, Heather kind of touched on the, the differences in your work that each of your books are so different from one another. What's next? Oh, well, I don't usually talk about what's next just because um, I, I, whenever I describe a story and I see the person's face and if they like a slight frown or a slight Twitter twitch in the eye, I think, oh no, it's a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. um, I've been working on something that is set in the world of music and I guess that's as far as I'll go with it. And I don't know if it'll work out. I don't know if it'll end up being my next book. We're at pretty protean stage. Um, music, well that, all right. <laughs> um, with that, I before everyone leaves, I, I of course want to thank Marissa Silver and Heather Scott Partington for taking part in this. And for everyone who's joined us today, next week we're going to switch gears. Um, in this current issue, we feature the Next West and have a number of trailblazers. Next Wednesday, June 16th at 12.30, we'll feature Stoney McKelly Love of Stuzo Clothing. She does gender-free clothing design for celebrities, um, for everyone. But this is, we're gonna talk about kind of the gender-free clothing and fashion movement um, and its origins and, and thriving kind of culture on the West Coast. So please join us for that. It's gonna be cool. We're gonna look at some fashion and talk about um, kind of the traditions of gender and clothing and how that's changing. So with that, again, this is recorded. It'll be up on altaonline.com today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations on the book, Marissa. Thank you. And um, stay safe, everyone. Take care. Hi, everybody. Thanks for showing up. <laughs>